again with The Art of Dreaming, and I am broadcasting outside the gates of a FEMA camp, really. Um, my guest today is author, writer, and editor Marilyn J. Lewis. And Hi. We'll get to her. Hey, Marilyn. She's on right now, but I wanted to uh, 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 talk about a couple things first, and that is our good friend uh, Bill Brockbrader, Bill Wood. He used to be over on our affiliate Wolf, Wolf Spirit Radio and, and has had a lot of controversy around him. Well, he got arrested uh, uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, a federal warrant was issued. He was over in Idaho. He was in, in Canada with his girlfriend. And um, who knows why he got arrested. Uh, there's some uh, speculation that uh, it stems from his 1998 uh, statutory rape conviction. Now he claims that in state court he was he was acquitted, yeah, but they but he was in the military and they 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 uh, court martialed him about it and he he spent some time in Leavenworth, um, but he says the whole charges were trumped up because when he was in the Navy SEALs doing uh, black ops, he refused the, to to continue with doing the uh, civilian bombings in Iraq, which which was in the late 90s, you know, before things started happening over there, or so he claims. And, of course, he also claims he was a guard at Area 51, uh, telecommunicated with aliens, uh, looked, uh, looked through Project Looking Glass. Anyway, as, as some of you may or may not know, the, the big controversy happened about three weeks ago when he suddenly came out and said the White Hats he had been in contact with uh, told him that Obama – Barry Sotero was actually a, a good guy working within the cabal to arrest all these evil politicians and bankers, and uh, no one was really buying that. And, and there was uh, all kinds of battles with that guy, Drake. In fact, right now as we speak, Drake is over on his radio station still talking about these imminent mass arrests, which he's been talking about for two months, and his, his datelines have, have gone, gone by, and they still haven't happened. But anyway... Uh, Bill Brockbrader, hope you get out, and hope uh, when you get out, or whatever you're in there for, if, if, if they're setting you up or whatever, just remember, where's Obama? Where's your buddy Obama? How come he's not getting you out of jail? All right. So uh, my guest is Marilyn J. Lewis. She's on the line. Hey, Marilyn. Hi. She uh, hails from the somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, I've, I've known Marilyn uh, since, what, 98? Yeah, 1998, yeah. Yeah, yeah 1988, same time when Bill Brockbrader was uh, bombing things in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, uh, uh, we, we, we both met through uh, uh, this defunct publisher called Masquerade Books, and uh, we, we were both writing sort of uh, what we call literary erotica, sort of racy sort of stories. Um, um, and, and since then, uh, you know, uh, Marilyn and I have been in a, a lot of anthologies together. We, we know a lot of the same people in the publishing world and all that good stuff. Um, and Marilyn, uh, you, you could go to her website, which is MarilynJLewis.com. Yeah. Is that right? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Marilyn, I'll, I'll put it in the chat room. Uh, and you could see her bio, uh, her books. Um, her, her latest book is, what is your latest book? Uh, <laughs> Twilight of the Immortal is my latest book, which came out last year uh, in uh, print and then uh, in ebooks towards the end of, of last year. A Kindle, well, it's an ebook; you can get it anywhere that they sell ebooks, pretty much. And 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 what is this one about? That's the one about uh, Hollywood in the silent era. It's um. Primarily about uh, gays and lesbians and bisexuals who uh, worked in Hollywood in the silent era, and it's um, historical fiction. So to the best of my abilities, um, I researched it, and it's true, you know. Um, I was telling you earlier there are a few fictional characters that kind of um, tell the story, but the rest of the people are in the book actually did live and uh, worked in Hollywood back then. And and one of your characters is uh, Rudolph Valentino? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the whole book's about him. Oh, the whole book's about him, okay. <laughs> I mean, there's like a lot of other people, but um, yeah, he's in there. So it's, it's um, 
uh, it's about 600 pages long, and um, the way I have it set up uh, structurally is uh, that it actually does tell the story of Rudolph Valentino from uh, the 19 teens when he was in New York and he wasn't famous yet up until uh, when he very famously died. Uh, when he was 26, so or 31 in, in 1926. Sorry. Um, so actually, the the whole story, the whole book, is um, used as a vehicle to tell the story of um, of Rudolph Valentino when he was a movie star. Okay, and and, and we were we were talking about uh, how you felt you were you were channeling some of these people. Oh my God! You yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I researched the um, the book for nine years, and uh, what was really kind of interesting in terms of being a writer and having to research historical stuff is when I started out uh, researching the book, the Internet was really kind of new, and you couldn't find a whole lot online about the silent uh, film days, so I was doing the old-fashioned way, going to the library and trying to find whatever books I could, whatever uh, documentary movies and that kind of thing. By the time I was done researching it, you could find out uh, everything about everybody from the silent film days online. Certainly Wikipedia is an awesome tool there. Um, and you can find the old uh, New York Times um, reviews of silent films and stuff. So by the end of it, it was it was really amazing what I had access to. But then it took me a year to actually write the book. And um, by then, the characters that were coming into the novel almost were coming in of their own accord. Like there were movie stars or, or directors that... I barely knew anything about who seemed to just really, really want to be in this book. And I felt that they were communicating with me and telling me their stories. And then when I would then go to research these people to see, okay, who were these people and how do they fit in the story, it was kind of uncanny that I already kind of had a, an idea of who they were. So, yeah, um, and Valentino especially, I felt that he was um, all over the place. But, you know, to, to be honest, it, it's all coming back to me now. I was actually in L.A. when I was, uh, and I had a chance to go to Valentino's um, last house, Falcon Lair, because a friend of mine was um, involved with a movie that was shooting there. And, um I knew next to nothing about Rudolph Valentino at that point, and uh, I felt like the house was haunted, that I had a very strong impression that he was still there and that I interacted with him. And from that moment on, really sort of uncanny things started to happen in terms of, uh, you know, books about him falling into my lap, and then suddenly there would be these, you know, movie marathons of all of his silent films and stuff like that, and that's when I decided, oh, I'm going to write a book about him. So I think fr from the beginning I felt like he, his his essence was definitely uh, out there. And, and and what about, you, you were also telling me about uh, uh, this other writer. Yeah, yeah, just, so... Yeah. Yeah, so Wayne uh, Hatford, and he's written a couple books that have been channeled through him. Wait Wayne, Wayne oh. Hatford, you said? Yeah, Wayne Hatford, uh, Valentino Speaks, and then the newest one that he has out right now, going. I think it's called Going for Excelsior. Uh, it's about aging, the art of aging. Um, mm. So I was... Uh, a judge in the uh, Dan Pointer's um, Global Ebook Contest last summer, and uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know I've been primarily known in the erotica world, so I thought that I was going to be a judge for the erotica category, but I wasn't, <laughs> and I was the judge in the nonfiction New Age category, which actually <laughs> was really cool. And uh, uh, you know, as an aside, as I mentioned before, I was. Um, very uh, amazed, pleasantly surprised by the high quality of the ebooks that were in that category, and they were primarily self-published. So uh, I really enjoyed that, you know, the uh, the high quality of the content as well as the production, you know, the design of the ebooks, um, the self-published uh, ebooks. But anyway, one of the um, titles that I was given to judge was Valentino Speaks, and um, it was 
Wayne channeling uh, Valentino, and uh, you know, when I saw the title, I was like, "Wait, what? You know, what's this?" Right? And uh, you know, as I started reading it, oh my God! You know, it was like, "Oh my God! This this is the same guy that was talking to me when I was writing my book." You know, and I was convinced. You know, this is Valentino. You know, so after the um, after the contest was over, you know, I got in touch with Wayne, and we we you know we definitely talked about it. How uh, we really felt that. Uh, the essence of, of Valentino was contacting both of us, and then he told me about some other people, which I, I don't think I'm really uh, at liberty to say who they are because they're private people, but um, they're all over America and then a couple in Europe, you know, who are also uh, seem to be in contact with Valentino's essence, and, uh, you know, we feel confident about this because we have – uh, so many things, you know, in common that kind of uh, are so so similar that that you know it's uncanny. So, uh, is, is there like this Valentino channeling society or? Well, you know, we kind of uh, we all kind of are together on Facebook, you know, friends on Facebook, but we're not like the cult of Valentino. You can't find us, you know, but uh, we know who we are. But, um, you know, I I'm not really active on Facebook. I kind of avoid it <sighs> like the plague, you know. But uh, when I do get on there, you know, I, I do try to interact with uh, the other people who are um, channeling Valentino in, in one way or another um, and finding each other on Facebook. So. Um, well, I was just wondering maybe if Valentino could start, you know, like predicting earthquakes and... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. You know, Michael, I know it's kind of like corny to say that, but, uh, you know, I, no, I, I just sort of wonder, like, well, what what's what's behind this, you know, why, you know, sort of like, oh, what was that, the close encounters of the third kind and the mashed potatoes, you know, and everybody's, like, being drawn to that one place, right? It's like, you know, it's are we being, like, groomed for something? But um, it could just be that uh, we're all really passionate about him, and he's hanging out, and he's able to uh, cross that veil and, and communicate with people and, 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 and help people. So it could be that that's all that it is, which is – pretty remarkable in and of itself, you know, but it, it's just really uncanny, and you, you, you do have to kind of wonder, like, wow, why, why is this going on? Well, you know, there's there's a novel in that, you know, this Valentino Society, and uh, there's Valentino up there in orbit with the Andromeda Council. And, uh, right, right. <laughs> or, or something like that, you know. Well, uh, I, uh, there are so many people writing and creating uh, things, uh, plays, uh, in Europe and over here and, and writing, uh, you know, historical fiction, crime, crime novels, um, romance novels. Mine was like historical gay lesbian novel. We, we couldn't be more different. And, and yet Valentino is playing a dominant role in all of these uh, works of art. You know, it's just uncanny. Wait, wait a minute. A crime novel like Valentino's The Detective? Uh, no, it has something to do with uh, Valentino's death. It figures prominently in the crime. I believe the, the writer lives in L.A. Uh, it, I think that came out in the fall. I can't remember the name of the, the book offhand, but, yeah, that came out in the fall. Uh, I believe. Someone, someone in the chat room is saying Valentino died before getting his American citizenship. Uh, no, I think he got it right before he died, or, you know, it could be that. I, I believe he oh. got it right before he died. He was in New York. Uh, to promote Son of the Sheik, which was his last movie. It was just about ready to come out, and he was going to get his citizenship, I believe, in the same trip. Now, if you go by my novel, he did get it, but that doesn't mean it's that's true. <laughs> it means oh, wait a minute. according to Marilyn. <laughs> oh, how did, I don't even know how he died. How, how did he die? He had a horrible ulcer um, that... Uh, and he a bleeding ulcer and then a um a appendicitis attack in new york um this was a one incredibly stressed out man that he was a, an unbelievably stre stressed out individual and um he uh collapsed at a party and they took him to the hospital and they had to give him an emergency appendectomy and then um peritonitis set in and within a few days he uh died in the hospital. Hmm. Was he so, a drinker? What was he? 
No, he was, uh, you know, he drank, like, champagne. I mean, he was not, like, an alcoholic. He smoked uh, a lot. He was a heavy, heavy cigarette smoker. He he drank red wine a lot. He would smoke uh, when he was going through, like, stressful periods. He would smoke about three packs of cigarettes a day, you know, that kind of thing. Um, he had a lot of uh, debts, for one thing. He He was um seriously in debt but he also had a lot of um problems with the movie studios you know he was um the first person movie star to successfully uh like go on strike against his contract and um and win so but they but he was suspended from making pictures for for quite a while but he ended up um winning but he was they were always at, at odds with him um, for one thing or another, but a lot of it stemmed from his wife, uh, who was his um, manager, um, and she was, um, uh, you know, uh, rumor has it, incredibly difficult to work with, and she made a lot of uh, bad decisions uh, for his career. Um, you know, so he had a lot of, like, career problems, and he was divorced from her uh, towards the end of, of his very short life, and I think that caused him a lot of stress, too, you know. How, how old was he when he died? 31. Oh, he's 31? Yeah, so it was, he was so, at the, his career. So does the essence, has the essence of Valentino, like, paid you a visit in the middle of the night? No, oh, you know, I don't, I don't have it like that. You know, I guess people have their different ways of, of being contacted by him, but... For me, it's um, just sort of like a very, very profound feeling, uh, you know, that's, you know, like if you think about somebody, let's say, then you just have like a thought about the person. But then you can have this sort of really um, heightened uh, awareness of, of a person. Like I don't see him like three-dimensionally. Um, I don't, he's never physical, but... Um, I can tell when he's around, if that makes sense. And certainly when I was writing the book, it was like he was living in my house. At the time, I was living alone in my house, so it was, you know, really um, him and me a lot. But um, but as I said, some of the other characters of the book were, like, hanging out, too. But I think that um, for some of the other people, uh, it's it can be like they can sort of see a physical a fleeting sort of physical image, you know, but I, I never have that. Well, what I meant by paying a visit was sort of like the uh, paranormal romantica genre. Well, you know what, <laughs> Michael? I kind of figured you were saying that, but I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. Well, I could, I could just be blunt. Have you had sex with Valentino? <laughs> yeah, family? yeah. I thought you were going to go there, but no. You know, he seems to have been much more interested in men, but um, of course oh, really? nobody can prove that, and there's so many arguments about it. But, yeah, so I think that he did love women. I think that he appreciated extremely beautiful women, and he, he appreciated sophisticated, cultured women. I do believe he loved his second wife uh, a lot. I think that's putting it mildly, but I also think that he was um, more uh, involved with men, uh, honestly. I mean, I researched it the best I could, and there are some people, you know, who believe he was just totally gay, and that people like me are just, you know, wishful thinkers or whatever, but um, I, I think that that's the only way to justify why he stayed with this horrible woman, you know, this woman, Natasha Rambova, who she might not have been a horrible woman, but she was really horrible for his career, and he stayed with her, and I think the only way you can explain that is because he loved her, you know, and after the divorce, he didn't live very much longer after the divorce. I think he was absolutely miserable without her, but um, it doesn't take away that he was um, very active with, um, you know, like people, ca cameramen and like crew people who were known to be gay. And he certainly hung out with Alana Natsimova, who was openly a lesbian, and she fixed him up with both of his wives. And so, you know, when you look at that, and I've been in the, the gay community my entire life, so I kind of know that, you know, you don't really move around in gay crowds if, if you don't have some sort of... Um, active interest in that 
realm in some way, if you know what, if you follow what I'm saying. Right. So I came to the decision that, you know, he, he was uh, maybe bisexual, but he definitely seemed to have liked men a lot. But, but, but no trashy Hollywood slats and, you know, he wanted, well, he liked the cultured women, right? Yeah, and, you know, there are books out there. This is, like, really like a whole hornet's nest, you know. If you go on the Internet and you go into these Rudolph Valentino uh, realms, you know, there are, are some people who are just so hardcore believers that he was absolutely 100% heterosexual and straight, and they'll, they're really rabid, rabid about it. You know, you really kind of want to, like, protect yourself from those people. But there are other people who are just as rabid that he was gay, and... um and there's, you know, some books that are just really scandalous about, that are based on these alleged diaries that he kept that, you know, the diaries are really famous, but nobody has ever, ever s seen them, you know, these famous diaries, these infamous diaries. But, um, you know, there's at least one whole book based on this, these quote-unquote diaries that nobody sees. And the, the writer of the book, I, I won't mention his name, you know, but he had a really famous book, and it's absolutely scandalous. And it's, you know, it's allegedly based on these diaries that nobody ever gets to see. So, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, there's quite a, there's quite a Valentino, uh, what is it? I guess a cult of Valentino out there, especially on the Internet. Um. <laughs> Uh, Nighthawk, the owner of the station, is writing, uh, I came in from the barn and I'm hearing gay, blah, blah, blah. What the heck is the show about? Um, <laughs> uh, he, he came in the other night when I was uh, uh, reading a sermon from this pastor who had uh, predicted the world was going to end on May 27th and Jesus would return, and he thought uh, he thought there was some sermon, an actual sermon. I don't know. Anyway, so... Um, how would you how would you categorize uh, uh, this this book? The book that I wrote. The the uh, yeah. The book the I Twilight, wrote. Twilight of the Immortal. What? Well, I I call it historical fiction, um, and well, you know, it certainly is uh, GLBT or LGBT, however you want to say that. Um, but there's so much more to the book that I really don't think it qualifies to be called like gay historical fiction. You know, it's really historical fiction about um, uh, the American entertainment industry from 1916 to about 1927 when it really shifted. You know, movies were already being made, but they weren't being really taken seriously yet. And then by the late teens, they started to have quite a dramatic effect on people, and more and more money was being put into it, and more and more money was being made. And, um, and then it shifted, of course, to uh, what became called Hollywood. Um, and, the, and as we know, it, ex it, it exploded at that point, you know, even though it, at that point it was actually doing much better in, in Paris. But um, the war, you know, World War I kind of brought Paris to a, a halt, so Hollywood was able to kind of uh, take over. But um, so, so it's about it's about that whole um, period. And as I said, I researched it as best as I possibly could to make it as accurate as possible. But I kind of have always liked that angle of um, people in entertainment who have to um, who are uh, gay or lesbian and having to. Um, you know, how they deal with that or whatever. I don't know. For some reason, I've always been fascinated about that whole topic. So I kind of skewed it in, in that direction, you know. But it is, like, his, historical about the whole period. Not everybody in it is gay. Um, what, what's interesting about how Hollywood formed, uh, and, and I, I touched on that in my obscure novel, The Rose of Heaven. Oh, I love that book, yeah. Um was that in uh, when they were making the silent films and the short Nickelodeons and all that stuff? Uh, and you know, and what, I don't know what did they charge a penny, five cents, whatever, to to, to see these things. Uh, Thomas Edison started realizing that there there was big money being made, right? Significant, 
And since he had he invented, or you know, the film was his, he, he invented the process. He started demanding a, a cut right. of, of every every all the revenue, even though they bought the film. He still right. felt that the process was under his copyright. And he anyway, he wanted a cut, and these producers wouldn't didn't want to do it. So Edison would hire the Pinkertons to come beat them up. So what happened was these guys, these producers, started moving further and further west to get away from the Pinkertons. Right. Well, they finally eventually just wound up on the east, west coast. Right. They couldn't go any farther. But yeah, yeah, it was some sort of patent issue that he was trying to push through. Yeah, yeah. That, that's always been a, a, a black mark on Edison. I mean, it, as much as we think of Edison as this big inventor hero, he, he, he had his uh, dark... Uh, yeah, I think he had some some a few black marks going on there, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that was one of them. Yeah. Um. So so how long did it take you to write this one? It took me a year to actually write it. You know, once I started writing it, it took me a year. But you you and you put it out yourself, right? No, I didn't. Uh, my agent at the time, uh, she spent a year shopping it around, and unfortunately, like. <laughs> You know, I, I managed to time it, like, fi finally finished it, you know, working on it for 10 years total, and, and I finish it right when the whole market, like, crashed, right? All so, right. Um, you know, so it we had some uh, issues with it, with every major publisher out there. You know, they liked the way the story, they liked the storytelling. You know, I've never had a problem with publishers and my storytelling, but they always seem to have a problem with my content. And even though this is not an erotic novel at all um, this time they were having problems with lesbians being in it if it was just Valentino they didn't care that I was saying he was probably gay um, they cared that I had all these lesbians who had like major major roles in, in this book um, but I think part of it it was it was 600 pages and um, you know now they're moving more towards things that are a whole lot easier to market and and all that stuff so you know we had a lot of uh, positive feedback but a lot of basically everybody said no so it, it wound up on the smallest publishing um, house known to man which is called Anaphora Literary Press and uh, but but she did bring it out and so I was very grateful to her but um, oddly enough um, she's not very keen on electronic publishing she was not interested in putting out um, an ebook and my my problem was that because it stages the it's got kind of a hefty price tag it's like 23 and change and it's in trade paper you know so I really was pushing outside the gates of a FEMA camp and today we're talking to author writer editor Marilyn J Lewis uh, but before we get back to Marilyn I just wanted to make a note that Revolution Radio here on freedomslips.com is completely uh, user uh, friendly user friendly uh, user what, what's the word am I looking for you uh, user anyway we depend on you our listeners to stay on the air we don't run any commercials as you could tell those were just station identification breaks uh, we don't no no ads no grants or anything so no one could tell us what we what topics we have or what kind of guests we can have on or, or whatever so if you go to freedomslips.com, right there on the landing page, you'll see a donation button, and there's also uh, products you could buy. You could buy uh, uh, banner ads. Uh, you could uh, sponsor a host like me or any other host, um, and that, that keeps us on the air. So give it a thought, and thank you for that consideration. So we're back with, with Marilyn, and... Um, Oh, I'm reading something here. Uh, so we're talking about ebooks. Uh, I, are you still there, Marilyn? Yes, I'm still okay. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I usually like, I hear little sounds or something or something. But um, <laughs> a lot of a lot of agents now are are putting out their clients' work as ebooks to get feelers. I mean, because if an ebook is uh, uh, generates a lot of sales and interest, and then you know that's that's a, a leverage for them to go to a, a a print house and say, well, you know, look 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 how well it's doing. I know I know my my former agent uh, had contacted me about a few months ago. He started his own 
ebook imprint. And he's like, well, let's uh, let's reprint all those old Blue Moon books of yours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I told him, well, I've already they're already out yeah. on ebooks, and and they I was having them come out through Olympia Press, and, and we were splitting the money fifty fifty. But now I'm I put them I, I reissued them under 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 my own imprint or whatever on uh-huh. uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Smashwords. Right. Yeah. All romance, and because you know, then I, I just get a hundred percent of the money. Why? Right. Why? Why should I be split in fifty fifty with with someone else? And and the money's significant. I mean, I, I the the reprints of my books, and then I, I do some other ones under various pen names. I, I'm not going to reveal that that uh, I'm actually surviving off ebook sales right now, for the most part. It, well, it's you know. Probably, okay. I just want to interject here, you know, if people are listening, uh, you know, I, oh, I also want to apologize to my, my readers because I thought I was going to be, like, viewable on this, you know, and if you could actually see me, I, I was kind of rolling my eyes through some of the stuff you were saying. But oh, yeah. first I, I just want to preface by saying, like, you're a really popular writer, you know. You're going to sell no matter what. No matter who's putting you out, you're going to sell. So, um it's it's not a surprise that by putting it out yourself, um, you're going to make s- significant money. And uh, you know, I've been re- retreading, you know, some of my old stuff and and making uh, some money there. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, or the the few erotic romances I wrote about ten years ago uh, brought me some more money. You know, um, so so that it is true that that you can uh, you know make better money my god you know even if you have even if you're with a, a publisher an electronic publisher the royalty split is just nothing like what it is in traditional print you know you just get so much more money and a lot of times you get it every month you know you get your royalty check every month but um if you aren't really well known uh it still comes down to promotion, so it, it is really easy to uh, publish your own ebooks. It's it's so easy, and I think that's just it's so wonderful. It's a powerful tool to give writers because, uh, for the most part, unless you're dealing with Kindle, you don't really have to deal with censorship. You can write so, uh, pretty much what you want, um, and like you said, you, you, it's basically your income, you know. But it also comes down to promotion and. And it's uh, that's that's like that's the hard part. That's the hard work, you know. For especially if people aren't very well known or they aren't established yet. Uh, oh, I wish I was that popular. My, my, that, then there would be more money. But anyway, the uh, actually Smashwords uh, has censorship too. Yeah, they do to an extent. Yeah, they do. They and do. It, I mean, if you're gonna uh, you're, you're gonna have serious trouble if you wanna write uh, about bestiality or, um, you know, a couple of the other right. taboos, you know, but um, uh, it's, Smashwords is a little bit more tolerant than uh, the Kindle machine, you know, I like to call it the Kindle machine because there, I don't think there are actually people involved in that, I think they're running you through some sort of keyword software and flagging you, you know, flagging, yeah. but, um, you know, I, I, I find you know, I love working with Smashwords. I think Smashwords is like God's gift to writers. I really do. I can't stress that enough. I, I really, I really love that. I've done a lot of projects with Smashwords that weren't, you know, not always my own projects even. Um, and I always direct writers towards Smashwords. But in my own experience, uh, I still, I sell better on Kindle. I mean, I, I just, uh, I guess because. Um, I don't know why more writers who are familiar with me in the first place, or maybe it's better uh, link, linked better. Like if somebody read one thing I wrote, it's a lot easier to find me again on Kindle. I don't know what what the difference is, but I I sell I sell better on Kindle, even though I have personal um is, you know personal issues with with Kindle, but and with Amazon, you know. So. Um, for anyone who doesn't know out there, uh, Smashwords is a, a ebook company. They're actually they're a distributor, and then yeah. you you upload or the publisher uploads their books there. And what Smash people could buy the books from Smashwords, and Smashwords has this uh, sort of a crunch converter. I can't remember what he calls it, but it, it converts your text. You send your text in through like a word file, and then it converts it into all all the all the uh, 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 formats that eBooks use. 
um, that are available. And what Smashwords does is they distribute it to all all the different outlets, um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, iBooks, uh, Diesel, whatever. And uh, and the, and actually, Smashwords doesn't really take that much of a cut. No, they don't. It's like what. Five percent, ten percent? Not, 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 not a whole lot. It's not a whole. I don't really remember offhand, but it's not a whole lot. Yeah, and they, and they pay quarterly. Uh, they're good about it. They, they, they're, they're. In my experience, they haven't been late. Um, and, and then you know, if if you want to put your own book up on on, on Kindle, or Barnes and Noble, you could opt out. Um, but Smashwords has has uh, uh, Mark Coker is is the guy who runs it. He's up in Northern California. Is he in Northern California? Yeah, I think uh, so. No, I don't think he's on. I don't think he's in California. I can't remember where he is. Well, maybe he's the Pacific Northwest. I know he's somewhere on the West Coast. Uh, he's he's pretty much revolutionized. Revol, revolutionized? Is that the word I mean? Revolutionized. Yeah, the 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 whole ebook market. Um, and and you know I've I've come around to the ebook market uh, mainly for financial reasons. Of course, you know, being a, a, a print guy, I was completely against it at first. Uh, you know, in the same way that people on radio said TV would, would never go anywhere. Right. Uh, people on film said video would never go anywhere. Um, it, I mean, I mean, I still, I still would rather, you know, have my, my books out initially in print. But I, I don't know. I, I'm starting to see that, that the future trend in publishing is, you know, everything's going to be electronic. And print books are just going to be a specialty thing, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. either limited editions, nice editions, or, or just uh, print on demand. Although print on demand, uh, the, the technology is getting better. Yeah, that was uh, something else I was going to mention. Uh, uh, Lulu.com. I do a lot of work with Lulu.com too. If I'm if I'm going to do POD, or it's important to me to have uh, print on demand. Um, then I go to Lulu, and I haven't had any problems. Uh, I, I've actually really enjoyed working with them. I've done a number of projects with them, and they do beautiful, beautiful work. And they also do ebook publishing as well, and they have uh, the same sort of distribution that you can get with uh, with um, Smashwords. Although I think that you might get a better chance uh, a better chance working with Amazon when you're with Lulu than with Smashwords. I'm not 100% sure on that. But um, anyway, if you want to do print on demand, uh, then I, Lulu has just has been an incredible company as well. When I was doing, you know, when I was head of the EAA, the Erotic Authors Association, and I was publishing you guys, actually, you were one of the books I published, I went through Lulu, and um, I really enjoyed uh, them. And also, I, I guess maybe it's not the best thing to, like, um, <laughs> broadcast broadcast this, but, you know, with Lulu, you can opt out from making it available to just anybody. With with the EAA books, the signature series, they were, um, you know, they were erotic books that no other publishers would touch. I mean, some of them were um, reissues. You know, they were out of print. Excuse me, but um, some of the books I published had um, your book was one of them. It had themes that other publishers did not really want to. Um, they didn't want to go there. You know, and so by opting out of of being publicly available, I could publish anything I wanted to and then just promote it directly through the EAA. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm not saying if you want to write stuff that flies in the face of <laughs> censorship, then do that, you know, because I don't think Lulu really wants to be known for that. But um, th it was really a pleasure work working with them when, when I did, when I have. And and their books don't have that that barcode at the last page, right? Like, like, uh, like on the like back, three. you've got a you have a barcode on the back cover. Yeah, on the cover, but but you know, like LSI and and uh, Create Space and Ingram, they. Uh, oh yeah, you're right. I'm looking at one right now. That, yeah. Yeah, it's it's it tells you this is a, this is a print on demand book. Right, right. But I've I've noticed the Lulu books don't. Actually, I was, I was looking at Lulu for something. Do, do, do they have a oh, – anyway, we'll talk about this later in private. Um, um, where was it? Oh, censorship. So, you know, the funny thing is – or not funny – is uh, uh, Amazon didn't start its censorship thing until maybe like a year and a half ago, two years ago. I mean, before they would just let whoever publish whatever. 
until mm-hmm. there was that whole scandal with that one uh, kind of, uh, uh, well, let's not talk about the topic, but the, the book. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then Smashwords was almost going to have to do that because PayPal right. uh, demanded it. But it turned out it wasn't PayPal, but it was the, the Visa and MasterCard. These right. banks who were, who were putting pressure saying, well, you, you can't process your, your, your books through us if you have, you know, uh, hardcore uh, BD, S&M, and whatever. Uh, but he, I guess Mark had, had talked him out of it, or, or I don't know. They, were, they yeah, it he didn't had, quite go uh, that way. Yeah, he had some serious uh, discussions with the PayPal people. And, and it wasn't uh, that BDSM was the problem. It was rape was the problem. They didn't want rape... Um, presented in a sexualized way, even if it was, um, you know, in a scene. Like, if it's, if it's non-consensual sex, then it's rape, and it doesn't matter if it's in a BDSM scene where both people are agreeing to it. So it wasn't just BDSM all across the board. It was, it was the rape issue. They were, they were having problems with that, you know. How, well, you know it having seems that. to me that, that almost all romance would be. Because you know, romance, you always see this woman being ravished by right. this guy, or, or. Well, you know. I think that's why why writers were just were instantly up in arms about that, and there were, uh, you know, I think that was well, Smashwords was amazing. I think that Mark did an amazing job uh, at getting that uh, potential volcano to not erupt. But you know, writers were up in arms all over the place because uh, if you were going by their definition of um, non-consensual sex and bestiality, uh, you know, uh, shapeshifters were coming under the, um, the banner of, of bestiality. I mean, they were, it was just getting ridiculous, you know, like half of the, half of the writers were going to be completely out, out of business. And, and I mean, it, what, then I'm not, even, I'm not even exaggerating on that, you know. So. Um, yeah, I, I guess that would fall, you know, under the paranormal romance, uh, a woman uh, falls in love with a werewolf, right? And he shapeshifts during sex. All of a sudden, it's uh, it's, it's taboo. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. So. What about vampires? I mean, they turn into bats. Uh, yeah, yeah. That wonderful bat sex that we all love. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, zombie and yeah, I guess. So. All right. So, um, <laughs> this is a far cry from uh, from uh, the literary erotica movement. I don't know if it was a movement that, that I don't happened. know what it was, but it was beautiful, and I miss it, you know. And, and of course, Richard Kasach just recently died. He died, you know, a few uh, oh, handful of weeks ago. Yeah, you didn't know. I didn't oh, know. Yeah, oh. he died. Yeah. So the end oh. of an era, officially. Yeah, he, he was a pioneer. I mean, he, was, uh, he was a Grove Press guy like uh, Kent Carroll and Herman Graff were. Mm-hmm. Um, who, those guys are out. And I think Kent Carroll's still publishing. Yeah, I think he's doing something, but Carolyn Graff is gone. Oh yeah, they they disappeared with uh, all of Avalon. Um, um, oh yeah, yeah. So Richard Kazak was uh, let's see, he was Masquerade, but what was he before Masquerade books? Uh, um, well, he did, was doing some sort of uh, paperback um, publishing, mass market paperback, uh, and book some particular bookstore in uh, Midtown. I don't honestly can't remember. But um, from there, he went to, to Masquerade, and he really changed. Um, uh, he really changed the face of erotica for for many years there. And I know that uh, Barney Rossett was doing the original Blue Moon kind of around the same time. But um, even though Barney and Richard both were um, bringing out uh, public domain erotica to 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 jumpstart their publishing houses, and Barney, the original. Uh, Blue Moon had just gorgeous, gorgeous covers. I mean, I loved his covers. Um, yeah. And then, uh, but Richards just went to the head of the pack. I, I don't remember why Barney was bought out of Blue Moon. I'm guessing you probably know that story better than I do. But um, but uh, Richard just uh, Richard was just amazing. And at, at the height of Masquerade, you know, he had so many imprints dedicated to all the various offshoots of erotica, and you know. With Marty, with her PhD from Harvard, and I mean, it was just an amazing, amazing achievement there when it was at its peak. It was just really 
some amazing writers, and you were one of them. And you know, M. Christian, Mark Pritchard was around, and uh, Thomas Roach. I mean, it was just uh, some amazing writers. Yeah. They, they actually never did any of my books. Uh, they, I was in the the magazine. Yeah, people out there. <laughs> My contention with Masquerade is they, they had bought three books from me. Uh, oh, a, right. A novel, a collection, and an anthology I had edited, and they, they went out of business. In fact, my, my story collection, I think, was at the printer, because I know they printed some copies. I actually found one copy someone had sent to me, uh, my collection, Seven Women. Uh, yeah. It was actually at the printer printing when, when they went out of business, and they, they, they stopped the print order. Yeah. Uh, eventually... Richard gave me the uh, the uh, the files, the court files, which I gave to the Venus Book Club, and they, they published it in that form. In fact, the Venus Book Club says masquerade books. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I, got, I kept I half the that. advance. I think Mark Pritchard was the last one to get out under the wire right before they went out of business. His his um, anthology came out for it first came out with them, and then Cleus uh, redid it in uh, trade paper. But yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Is that the book with where the woman's feeding the chicken on the cover? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does it make no sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the chicken, yeah. He had a much better cover at Cleus. Oh, my God. Too Beautiful. That was the name of it, and he's some girl feeding a chicken. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I got that book. Um, so people actually, we go, we're talking about Barney Rossett. He he actually died, what, uh, about six months ago, a year ago? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Barney Rossett was uh, the founder of Grove Press, very, very famous publisher from the 50s and 60s, the first guy to publish uh, uh, um, uh, Samuel Beckett in English. Uh, he published... Uh, Cancer, right? Well, actually, that was, that was originally published. No, that, that was Olympia Press. Well, no, I mean in the States. Oh, yeah, in the States. He, yeah. He, he published uh, books that were actually banned by the U.S. Uh, they wouldn't let them be distributed here. Actually, people had to sneak them in in suitcases and stuff to, you know, like Tropic of Cancer, uh, Naked Lunch. Uh, he did Lady uh, Chatterley's Lover, too. He did Lady Chatterley's Lover. Uh, he did uh, I, Richard Brodigan's first book, but it, it flopped. And Anyway, Grove Press in the 60s up to the 70s and, and even the 80s, uh, was known as, as you know probably one of the, the the biggest experimental edgy publishers and then he um, how, how he lost he lost his uh, he lost his stake in, in Grove press they there was just too many he had too many debts and he had to he had well I to, think he put too much money on I am curious yellow and then a follow-up movie to that and and uh, oh that's right right yeah yeah he lost. <laughs> well anyway he sold the imprint to uh, Neil Ortenberg who had, who had moved Thunder's Mouth Press to a conglomerate. And, and actually, Neil put out his biography, uh, the film. He did a film on... on oh, uh, right, on, right, right, yeah. Uh, um, and and that's when I came in with, with Blue Moon. Um, and they they were signing me up, you know, five, six books a year, mainly in, after the third book, because mainly they knew I would deliver and they just needed books to be filled in. And they really didn't really have an editor there. They just had this guy who, uh, who just bought things, and he didn't really edit. Um, and after a while, they just wouldn't even look at my books. They would just send them straight to the, oh, to the that printer. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I started experimenting. I would toss in, like, some, some taboo stuff in there once in a while just to see if they'd catch it. <laughs> and they, they never did, so that's how I knew that they weren't oh. even looking at my manuscripts. <laughs> uh, well, you had some great books, you know, with them. Some of those paperbacks were amazing. Uh, yeah, some of them were. Some of them were. <laughs> Some of them weren't. Um, <laughs> and may, maybe we'll talk about that uh, at the second hour about you know genre and, and whether or not writing erotic books has uh, affected your your career and other things because you 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 seem like you're not really writing erotic anymore, right? No, no, I'm not, and that's a whole other you know that's a whole other radio show I could go on and on about why I'm not doing that, but you're correct. Yeah. Um, have Have you experienced has it? been like a, a black mark on you with, with some people or no not no it's not at all like that people are actually really receptive when they find out that i write erotica or i have written erotica um 
because now it's it's resurging in popularity, but in more of an erotic romance vein. And so a lot of like hundreds of millions of people seem to think that that's what erotica is, erotic romance. And, you know, that's not really all that it is. But, um, I, you know, I write literary erotica and I and I and I that's that's what I do. And there's really no print market for whatsoever, you know, no print market. And when I um, when I wrote Freak Parade, Back, I think it finished it in 2005. My agent shopped that novel for five years before we finally gave up on it and said, okay, I'm going to publish this myself. And that was another one of my books where the, um, well, we had one publisher who absolutely just hated the book, but um, all the other um, publishers loved the book. They just had no, they, they didn't have a market for it. They had no place to put it, you know. And so that's when I decided. Uh, well, you know, I'm just going to publish this myself, and uh, I published it in 2010 in trade paper and in hardcover and ebooks, and then it went, and then it won the Independent Publishers Award for Erotica last last May. So, and we're back with the Art of Dreaming, your host with the most, Michael Hemmingson, the man who. One shook his own hand just to see what it felt like. <laughs> no, I stole that from Sean Morton, sorry. And um, anyway, uh, we're here with Marilyn J. Lewis, author, writer, editor, singer, songwriter. You, you still play your guitar, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't have real calluses anymore, but <laughs> not like it's not like the old days, no. Okay. But um, actually, I do want to, yeah, well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, I'm working on a... Um, a, a multimedia memoir that will include um, some of my uh, songs from my singer singer songwriter days. So, yeah, I wanted to bring that up because um, uh, a lot of people associated with with Revolution Radio happen to be uh, singer songwriters. The the owner of the station does uh, actually have quite a few albums out, and uh, uh, used to be pretty heavily involved in the music, and he still is. And uh, there's there's other people. Connect you to the radio station. Her uh, kind of side sideways side sideways, or, or or you know, they're musicians like I am. You know, uh-huh. even though I just mainly collect instruments, and I'm still for the past five years trying to master the upright bass. Um, what what uh when 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 and what were your 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 were you in a band or did you do? The, I like, was. A, basically a solo singer songwriter and I would have a band that backed me up you know I wrote I wrote the music and I sang and I played the guitar it was mostly rhythm and um, I had a backup band uh, for most of the most of the time when I first started out for the first year it, I believe of course it's going way back but I think it was like the first year it was just me and and my guitar singing in the east in the in the village in the West Village in in, in Manhattan. You mean like uh, uh, coffee houses or like Folk City and Speakeasy oh, right. and uh, the uh, Kenny's Castaways and uh, those places, you know. Do you, tried do, you, do you miss those days? Uh gosh, that's a loaded question, Michael. <laughs> I know. They, it was hard, you know. Music was hard back then. It was very, very expensive, and it was hard to be a girl. <laughs> If I can play that card, you know, it was hard to be a girl. And if you weren't just like some, you know, black leather wearing chick, you know, and maybe punk rock or or, or a rocker, just a rocker, which I wasn't, um, I think maybe, I don't know, I don't suppose it was any easier for them. It, it was just like, I guess it wasn't as, any easier for them. But, um, you know, they, there were only so many slots that could have chick chicks in them you know so um so that part it was uh hard and and then uh also in those days you really seriously had to uh conform to what they thought of as commercial you know or even um alternative you know there was like a pretty uh, you know so there was a definition for alternative as well you know so you had to fit that definition too and and one of the things i i love now to see so many younger people and certainly women my god you know it doesn't matter if, if you're a girl and you want to 
be a musician. It's not a problem at all nowadays, you know. But um, you can do so much in your room, um, so much more affordable. Um, you know, back then to even buy a four track was just like so expensive and, you you know, to rent rehearsal space and you always had all the musicians. I mean, it was just really, really expensive, you know, and now there's so much that you can just do in, in your room on your computer, you know, it's just and so and, and because, again, they have the distribution problem. You know, everybody needs to be heard. How do you get your music out there? How do you get people to know you're alive? You know, there is that problem. But um, the the flip side of that is that anything goes. You know, you can you can create whatever's in your heart, and it doesn't matter if it falls into some particular um, definition of what's going to fly. You know, you can just put it out there, and I think that's really beautiful. And I that part I miss. It's like, okay, it was too bad I wasn't able to do that um, in the 80s and in the early 90s. But, um, the re you know, the rest of it I, I don't miss. It, it, the music business was just like a pain in the butt. I mean, there was so much that I hated about the music business, so that part I don't miss. Yeah, you, you'd also have to uh, uh, be, be uh, handled by the Illuminati <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I felt the same way about you know I've I've got all that software you know GarageBand and Sonic or whatever and played around with it and 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 I just think that wow God if I had this back in the right. late '80s you know right. I think I, I spent five hundred bucks on a on the on a four track uh, you know a Tascam your usual thing mm -hmm. um, and and you can get you know you, on your laptop you know just studio quality or you can, or just even take what 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 you do and take it to a studio and and remaster it for not as much money mm -hmm. and uh, and the musicians were were have found that independent do it yourself market before the self publishing books happened you know with the right. my my space and then selling selling their songs on Kindle you know for for 99 cents each there there was that uh one of the women on on American Idol uh, 2005, I think it was. Uh, she was from here in San Diego, and for, from from where I hail from, and she uh, she owned a tattoo parlor with her boyfriend. But she had she had been signed up uh, with a major record label when she was 17 or 18, and she had like a, a two million dollar six record deal. The, the record company was paying for her her apartment, her car, blah blah blah. And then, so when her first album came out, it only sold like 500 copies or something. So they tossed her out of the apartment and broke the contract. So you know, lo and behold, you know, uh, you know, six or seven years later, she's on American Idol, and these old songs of hers that that she did not have copyright on, uh, like she had one on, on a Kindle or on Amazon, and it it, it sold over a million copies at 99 wow. cents each. Wow! Wow! All that money, you know, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you know, she she got to the top, you know, the top ten or whatever, and and you know, got another record contract. But um, yeah, that's 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 another way for musicians to do it. You know, just put put their music out there, and 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 that pretty much uh, has destroyed the the music industry, hasn't it? Or at least yeah, forced yeah. forced them to change their uh, their uh, approach to everything. Yeah, yeah, it did. It really forced their hands. And I have to say that, you know, I did have some friends who were, you know, executives in the music industry. And I don't like, you know, I'm not saying, oh, gosh, I'm glad they're out of a job because I'm not glad about that. But I, I am glad that um, it did have to, it, that it changed, it changed, the, it changed everything. It changed the rules, you know, on the side of the musicians. And, and but like I said, you still have the distribution uh and the promotion problem the same way you do with with ebooks you know you still have that to, that you have to deal with but um artistic creativity seems to be um flourish, flourishing you know so well even the the capitol records building is now empty oh. <laughs> they're not you know the big famous capitol records yeah building of course i do Hollywood. yeah yeah at the top is a the penthouse for the president i, I i've been up there because i i knew this actress who was dating the president for a while and uh, this guy didn't know anything about music. I don't know. He must have. He must have uh, uh, blackmailed his way up. But he, <laughs> this, guy, this guy had no clue about the music industry or or what sold or anything. But he. Was, but yeah, it was really nice. I mean, the whole top floor of, of the Capitol Records building is a, a penthouse for the for the, the the top guy. But they're not there anymore. I mean, it's uh, 
I guess they didn't need a whole building like that anymore. And, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you, there's people running small labels out of their apartments with a computer. Um, like, there's one in L.A. called a, a Gold Standard Label. It's G, GLS, and everyone thinks it's Gold Standard. But it, actually, GLS stands for a Guaranteed Student Loan, GSL. Because they started the record company with their students and loans. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and you know they're 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 a mid. You know all all my friends in bands, people I know in bands, you know they tell me that, um, you know actually the sales of their songs and 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 records or CDs, uh, isn't where they're getting their money. They're getting their money by you know going on the road. Right, and, the merchandising uh, part. Merchandising, exactly, yep. merchandising. Yeah. Uh, Especially like girl bands, you know. I, I know a couple of girl bands. They'll 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 sell like you know they'll they'll uh, they'll write their signatures on on underwear or something, or 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 some of them even design their own clothes. Or or I know this one bass player woman. She she made dolls. You know, and they they sell these things and people buy them, and that's how they make their money. Wow. Yeah. yeah plus too. Yeah. Yeah, and plus you know whatever club they're in, you know, if if the club pays decently or, or not. Um. Um, so I guess I go, I'm looking at your slideshow photos, and I see your 1986 poofy hair glamour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that hair. You know, on a on a on a good day, on a special day, like if I was going to be getting my picture taken, boy, it took me a long time to get that hair to stand up straight like that. <laughs> wow. It Aquanet. It took a lot of Aquanet in those days. Oh, the 80s. See, I have a nostalgic thing for the 80s. and I do now, now that it's really far away. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 yeah, when you, you know, I see a, a, an 80s TV show, I'm like, my God, did people dress that way? Wait a minute, I dressed that way. <laughs> I used to do the Miami Vice thing. Did you really? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. God, I had a whole outfit ensemble, you know, pastels. Right. No socks, white pants. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but but not when I was playing in a band because then then you know because we were kind of gothy, so you know I, I got all you know the, the 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 leather jacket and the purple hair and all that stuff. Oh, um, okay. But but yeah, I, I I don't know my 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 music. You know, I was doing it in the late '80s and and uh, you know I, I still have some of my guitars from back then and. Every now and then we'll listen to an old demo tape, and and I, I have to admit I, I feel kind of haunted by, what if, what if I kept at it? Because I, I just kind of, after, the main band I was in fell apart, I, I just I lost interest. Um, uh -huh. I went back to writing because I wasn't writing, when I was doing the music thing. The, the music thing was, creative enough for me at the time. Um, I don't know. I guess in an alternate universe, another timeline. I, some drugged out rock star, uh, yeah. or, or was. Yeah. Well, there probably is a parallel uh, reality where everything played out for you and you're experiencing it over there. Well, even the, you know, the quantum physicists scientists all say they're, you know, they, they've mathematically proven the, the uh, alternate parallel realities, uh, different timelines. Uh, you know, the New Age people will say, well, God or source or creation to, to experience everything through us, you also, it also explores every various decision we can make. Right. So every, every decision, possible decision we can make, splits off into these different timelines. You know, right. what would happen if you turned right instead of left? What, what would happen if you stayed with so-and-so instead of leaving them? Or, or if you married this person or, or whatever. Um, and, and there's actually, you know, there's, there's a couple people who have books and tapes about how to do self-hypnosis where you could actually visit these other yeah yeah I actually believe that and I, I believe that you can do it at, like through dream recall and, and a lot of dream work if you get good at remembering your dreams you, you can sort of uh, explore those kind of scenarios conscious, consciously you know, and and I I believe that um, you know I, I kind of do I believe that all these various uh, elements will will play out in whatever um, whatever way is po is feasible or possible or whatever, and um, you just pick one avenue that you're 
you're conscious of. And, and I feel that, um, you know, like if you really pay attention to the people you know, uh, <laughs> It's just kind of a weird thing to say. But, I mean, if you really are really super consciously paying attention to everybody like I do because I'm neurotic, um, you can sort of feel certain people. You know that things played out differently in some other, in some other realm because, I don't know, because there's just this, ener there's just this energy between you and this, this other person or whatever, you know. So I know it sounds kind of weird the way I said it, but. Um, I, I, I don't know. I believe it. You're saying in a, in a another timeline, you you might be together with this person, or or whatever might have played out a little differently. Um, okay. that you're just like intensely connected to a, a, a given person in uh some way. Like if things are go you, working out really badly between you and a person in this realm, there's another realm where uh it's working out really well or vice versa you know I, I that those kind of things like you can just feel that you're so connected to people you know beyond what's just going on that right in front of your face i guess <laughs> there, there's this uh metaphysical hypnosis guy called uh it's dr bruce goldberg he's got a book out and tapes and stuff and 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 he's he meets patients but he he claims, and he says he's done this himself. He claims you, with with intention and and some you know focus, that when you're you're exploring your different timelines, that you could shift your present conscious into a different life, a different timeline. Mm -hmm. But but what I wonder is, well, what about your other self in that timeline? What happened to them? You know, yeah. at, and and are you going to be? How can you? I don't know. I guess that's all in a, a different. Uh, reality that you don't have to start thinking about it but uh he says he he's done it himself and uh i might i might give it a try maybe i'll uh you know i'll be uh i'll shift to my timeline where i'm a, a famous porn star poet <laughs> <laughs> you know i think that it all comes down to um uh understanding that um perception is different and and i think that if you can truly understand that conscious perception can be different in different ways then it it becomes easier to to accept that that uh different kinds of quote-unquote reality are playing out all all around us you know but we're just for whatever reason in the physical reality locked into a certain way of perceiving things because that's what the, phys the physics of being here is all about you know and if you can let go of being rigidly locked into well this is how we perceive things and at least you know maybe we don't know how we perceive things on another timeline or in another galaxy far far away you know but at least if we can start thinking yeah it could be that there's a whole other way of perceiving stuff it, it gets easier to accept that um all this other these other selves are are playing out all around us and we just are we're just focusing in on on just one of them you know um yes so <laughs> back to the books so I, i'm i'm seeing here you've got a couple of uh recent sort of recent uh erotic romances uh new or new orleans night and, uh, yeah, those, Hollywood Nights. Those are retreads. Those uh, Hollywood Nights used to be uh, uh, one that had a different name that is escaping me right now. The one with the swans on the cover. That was a really popular one for me. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, all of them are uh, like New Orleans Nights was uh, okay. All right, I'm. Uh, completely incapable of remembering what the original titles were, but they all came out in 2003 and early 2004, and those are just the electronic versions with, with new new titles that came out with a different with a different publisher. Ren Renaissance eBooks e brought them out, new titles. Are, are, are these stories, is that your new, new Orleans story from that anthology, that New Orleans? No, mm -mm, no, oh. that's, a, that's an erotic romance novel that Richard Kasek originally published. And it was, I wish I could remember these titles, <laughs> but I can't. 
Oh, was that was that the imprint? He had a special deal with Barnes and Noble. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, um, the what, the Magic Carpet books, and it was um, yeah Barnes and Noble. It was Barnes and Noble, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was his last uh, foray into publishing, wasn't it? Well, um, Magic Carpet switched to publishing children's books, I believe. Uh, he, he shifted over and made was making making doing doing better there. So, but uh, as I said, he recently died. So now Magic Carpet is no more. Yeah, the young adult market. Uh, my my current agent, he he has a big focus on young adult, mostly the teens in trouble sort of market, and uh -huh. he says he says it's big. Uh, I've got a couple of teens in trouble ideas. I'll probably do at some point. Um, and then, then that market will probably crash by then. So. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but I, I found that, that uh, actually the young adult teens in trouble market, uh, actually a lot of teens don't read it. It's a lot of adults read that stuff. Oh, wow. They, I guess a, they, they want to remember what it was like to be a teen in trouble. <laughs> I guess. Well, I, everyone's been a teen in trouble at some oh, point. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Okay, are, is uh, Constable Robinson putting out a, a Mammoth Presents collection of yours? Yes, they are in uh, in ebook format. It's um, like the the best of Marilyn J. Lewis erotic stories that they have published over the last ten years. Yeah, I got one coming out too. Um, yeah, I thought I thought they were going to be out by now, but. Well, there's something to do with Maxim being on some wonderful holiday. <laughs> oh, he's always on holiday. <laughs> and when he gets back, I'm sure the books will come out post haste. <laughs> Actually, I want to interview him, but he he talks so fast in that accent. I'm wondering. Well, I mean, he he used to have a radio show, or maybe he still does. Oh, that's uh, right. Oh my God, I forgot about that. Yeah, and he's also like. He, he's the judge at, you know, like the Venice Film Festival. Film Festival and, I know. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he's all over there. Did, did he ever tell you about his, uh, his selling the film rights to, a, uh, what was that, a novella, Nebraska, or? Oh, Montana? Montana. No, he, I didn't know that. He told me about it. Well, actually, what happened, this is an interesting story. Uh, he sold the film rights to uh, Nicole Kidman. Uh, it was actually a, 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 a proxy person, but he found out through his agent it was Nicole Kidman. And he got a quarter million dollars for it. Wow. Yeah. I wow. mean, they, they, I guess they initially offered him a hundred grand, and uh, so he got an agent involved, and the agent got it up to a quarter million. Uh, and, and, of course, it never went in development, and I think like two years ago they asked him if he wanted to buy it back for a hundred grand. <laughs> he just laughed. <laughs> Yeah. Well, man, I, 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 I wanted that kind of, you know, uh, uh, book option deal. The, the most my book options get are, you know, like 10 grand or something, 5, 10. Yeah, um, but you've always got something optioned, though, Michael, and a whole lot of people never get that. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got like four or five books and some screenplays option. But, you know, they, the, the reality of it is, is you know, they, they sit in development. I mean, someone gets excited. I mean, you know, paying five, ten, fifteen grand for an option is, is really nothing uh, right. out there. You know, if it, if it's a big company, um, and they sit on it and they reoption it. Like my my book, The Dress from Blue Moon, has been with in development with Cinemax for the last five years. Every eighteen months, they keep reoptioning it. Uh, I haven't seen the script yet. And they said there's a script. Uh, you know, they were going to shoot it as one of those like late night Cinemax cable things. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, yeah, for the last five years, I think I've made, you know, like maybe 25 grand on, on off all those, 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 uh, re options. Um, wow. You know, it's always, yeah, always said that about, you know, Jim Carroll was living off of his, uh, options for basketball diaries for, for years that, you know, they, they were always optioning that, not making it. And then of course they finally did. Uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, Kurt Vonnegut had said, I read in an interview that he made more money because, you know, every short story and book he's written w w w was optioned. Uh, mm. And he said he made more money off the options than his royalties. And, you know, he, he his books sold pretty good. I mean, I, the last I heard, uh, 
Cat's Cradle was going to be made by uh, um, uh, Leonardo Di- Di- DiCaprio. He, hmm. had, he, had, he had bought the uh, the rights, and you know that and, and that book's been in in a, uh, on the tables of, of various producers since it was published in the '60s. Yeah. So uh, that's what I need to do more. Right? I need to <laughs> more more options and and and, and bigger sales. I, I kind of fell out of the Hollywood thing for for a couple of years, and I, I need to jump. Back. I'm actually going to jump back in with the help of a, another host on this 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 uh, Revolution Radio. She's a a former. Uh, she used to be a manager in Hollywood. Her, her husband is a, a an entertainment attorney, and she's going to help me set up some more meetings because my my current manager has uh, disappeared on me. Oh. So I mean, and this is this is a good segue in, into what I wanted to get back to was was uh, uh, if if you've had any stigmata black marks about writing erotica, and probably not so with women because you know everyone's like, oh, a woman writes erotica, but but with me, you know, especially in the film business and and other things, the the first thing, I guess even some of the people here on Revolution Radio, the first thing they think, you know, they say, oh, he's written some erotic books, that they're all this these crappy sort of you know. Nothing but pages of thrusts and oh yeah and and uh, whip me and and smack and whatever, without even reading the books. When you know, I I would say that I write literary erotica, and what literary erotica is is just your basic literary type fiction. It just happens to have uh, explicit sex scenes, right? And you know, Anais Nin and and. Uh, 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 Henry Miller. I mean, those are literary, right? and and in what, a lot of ways, you could say that that uh, um, John Updike or Philip Roth write literary erotica because their books are full of sex, right? Especially like Portnoy's, Portnoy's Complaint or, right. or Updike's uh, uh, Rabbit books are are just filled with X-rated explicit scenes, right? But they they get marketed as literary fiction, right? Um, um, but so so that's one that's. Sort of one of the reasons why I don't publish it under my own name anymore, and others I'm just not feeling in the mood. I mean, I'll, I'll basically write some stories. I've been writing a lot of stories for Misfit books. Have you have you heard of the Misfit? Not Misfit, but uh, uh, Mischief books. Oh no, uh uh-uh. uh. Mischief is a new imprint from Harper and Collins UK. Um, they just started off with eBooks, I and mean, they might go into print, but. Um, they're doing, you know, like 12 anthologies a year, you know, and I, I sold them a story for every anthology under pen names or my names, and I, I forgot about it, and, and a couple months ago I got paid for like seven of them at the same time. Wow. You know, there's like $1,500 in my bank account, I'm like, whoa. And, <laughs> and, and that, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the things that keeps me writing erotica. It's, it's, it's not a lot of money, but it, every everything counts. Well, you know, I have to say, Michael, that I'm just not, I'm just not that way. And I, and I remember, like, this kind of reminds me of my favorite Michael Hemmingson uh, experience that I, that I often uh, tell people over drinks in dark bars. Like, when you were visiting uh, in, uh, when I was still living on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm, like, in the, my room all day long writing one sentence over and over, and I'm, like, agonizing over this one sentence. And this is, like, totally, that's me. I, it takes me forever to write something because I, I just, like, sentence by sentence I go, like, insane and then uh i came out of my room like the next day and you said oh i, I wrote a novel last night <laughs> it's like oh my god no you i know? finished a novel well i know i was kind of okay. like made, you know dramatic effect there but it was like that it's like you know you stayed up all night you wrote a novel and i'm still writing the same darn sentence over and over so um yeah, but um, that, that part of it is is that it takes me a long time to write something. But the other part is that I have to absolutely, completely love what I'm writing. Otherwise, I just have real trouble uh, making it come out. You know, I have to just really love what I'm doing. And I'm I'm just I'm I'm done with the erotica. You know, maybe like ten years from now, suddenly I'll write something erotic. I, I doubt it, but. You know, I, I I mean, I was doing it for over 20 years. I've said everything I feel like I I needed to say about people and, and sex, you know. So uh, it's just like it doesn't, 
resonate for me anymore. And so the thought of, like, writing stories for everybody's anthologies or, you know, I get publishers to say, you know, write us something, we'll publish it. And it's like, you know, I don't have it in me. I'm, I'm more interested in, in these other types of stories now. So that's kind of, like, where, where I'm at, you know. Uh, yeah, well, it's the same for me. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I'd have more money if, if, if I did all the anthologies and, Oh, I know. Yeah, and I was editing anthology. I mean, every time I turned around, I was, like, just making all kinds of money there for about 10 years, you know, and then I just kind of got, well, things really started to go into the erotic romance vein, and I tried it for, like, a year, and it burned me out. I just I just really did not enjoy that kind of, um, you know, serious genre writing, you know, but... Um, yeah, because you you had to have a happy ending, right? Yeah, to have a happy ending. And in those days, which, you know, it, it changes so quickly, we're talking about like nine, nine years ago, or, uh, nine or ten years ago when I first started writing erotic romances, um, they were still new. And uh, even Barnes & Noble, they were like a little bit worried about uh, what was going to fly, you know, so they had to be heterosexual and they had to be, they had to deal with um, like only like three three specific acts, you know, that there were certain things you weren't, one key thing, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it on the radio, but, you know, like, I was, like, known for writing anal sex stories, and, you know, it's like, you can't go there and back then, and it was like, well, what the heck am I going to write about? It was just so boring, boring, you know, book after book, where you have to ways to make it sound, you know, this really ordinary sex sound exciting, you know, uh, but, um, it has changed since then. You know, now now people can write about all kinds of stuff in erotic romance. You know, and they have all these different paranormal offshoots and stuff like that. So um, it, it's changed a lot from when I first started doing it. But, um, you know, anyway. Well, I, I know where, when I was working with Olympia Press, the thing was like, well, if it doesn't have an anal sex scene, it's not going to sell. Uh, exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. I'm not buying it if there's no anal sex in it. You know, I know that one. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, um, where was I? What What is this book? Uh, Dirty, filthy, lovely, dark erotica. That is my follow-up uh, short story collection from Lust, which came out on Allison with Allison Books in 2004, I believe. Um, and then Dirty, Filthy, Lovely is all of my short stories that came out since 2004. Um, they call it dark erotica because I suppose that I got darker after 2004. Um, the, the themes are a little bit, uh, you know, possibly disturbing to, to people. Um, so, so they called it dark erotica. But um, it's, it's just a collection of all of my short erotic fiction since 2004. There and, and, and I was thinking of trends here. I know that uh, I know this uh, woman who's at Simon and Schuster now. She's over at Alora's Cave, which uh -huh. I think I think has the uh, uh, the registered patent on on Romantica. Um, uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, because I, I I wanted at Olympia. I wanted to edit an anthology of uh, Romantica short stories just because I thought it would sell. And uh, I was told, no, no, Alora Caves owns that 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 term. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, this woman had, had of course, approached me to do some stuff at, at Laura's Cave, and I'm like, no, I, d I don't write that, that, that formula of fiction and, and what they mm -hmm. do. But they're starting a new imprint, or maybe they've started already, which is it's just like a, a men's, a men's fiction, which doesn't have to be, doesn't have to follow a formula, and doesn't have to have a happy ending. It could be violent. You know, it's, it's almost kind of like a... a Old men's adventure fiction with, with sex and violence and stuff. And, oh, how cool! And there, there, there might be a trend of that going back. I mean, you know, all these genres have trends; they come and go. Right. Uh, um, and that I can get into. Yeah. I, I might, I might do some. I have a couple ideas in mind, but yeah, I actually uh, could probably enjoy writing something like that too under a pen name. You know, that would actually be kind of fun. Well, you should check it out. Go to their website, and they have all the or. Or I can give you the contact of the, this woman I know. Um, uh, it's too bad she's not at Simon and Schuster anymore because I'd rather sell her book. For Simon <laughs> exactly. I, exactly. I, I am doing a book for Simon and Schuster, but it's a uh, nonfiction about the uh, Tijuana drug cartels. Ooh, uh, how nice! Called the the uh, Bloodstained Corridor, uh, which which like all my books are it's it's a 
quite behind. But you know, things keep coming. Anyway, so yeah, it's yeah. So uh, with me, I'm 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 you know not doing as much erotica or under pen names, and seem to be more focused on uh, nonfiction uh, and stuff like that. Uh, any, anyway, we're not talking about me. We're talking about you. <laughs> uh, oh, this is what I want to talk. Your 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 collection of uh, novellas, Neptune and Surf, uh, seems to be your your most uh, uh, reprinted different editions book. Yes, and it just came out in France again this past fall. It came out under a different title called Sex in America, and <laughs> uh, it they took out the Mercy Cure. It's only two novellas, so it's a real slim little volume. It's got Johnny's Girl and Neptune and Surf in that. Um, in, and so that's in French. That came out again. But, yeah, yeah, that's like a really um, – that's been an amazing book for me. It's done – it's done amazing things for me, and, I, and I'm really happy that it's uh, that it's still in print. And and also, Maxim uh, Maxim bought that too. I hope I'm allowed to say that. But they're going to be bringing out the first complete unexpurgated electronic edition of uh, Neptune and Surf. So for uh, Constable. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I know you had you had a Masquerade edition and a Blue Moon edition and a. Uh, book club okay. edition. Yeah, and then I had it twice. It's come out in France. Um, I can't remember. I guess that's it. And now it's coming out ele electronically. I, I was getting ready to publish it myself because I have always, always dreamed of having a really great cover for that book. I wanted a Coney Island cover with, uh, you know, the either the Ferris wheel or the roller coaster, you know, something in the boardwalk. But um, I always got these pictures of ladies in their underwear you know and so i was gonna like try to bring i was gonna bring it out myself until maxim proposed that they wanted to um that they wanted to republish it and and uh <laughs> you know we both said well it'll be interesting to see what what the cover is will indeed look like but i'm guessing a uh, girl in her underwear is what's gonna, <laughs> is what's gonna happen yeah they always seem to pick you know these these kind of I mean, they're you know whatever sensual, but they also mean the same covers of uh, uh, from these stock photos of uh, uh -huh. women in the underwear or the stockings or or maybe a slight butt crack or something like that. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Even and, the Paris one, the Sex in America. I mean, it's like you know, I guess technically it's a pretty cover. I mean, it's a girl in in her underwear and some amazing stockings. I guess. Uh, yeah, she's got some some pretty stockings and uh, some sort of a medallion on her neck and lots of makeup, and that's it. I mean, that has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with this book, uh, but that's what they think will sell it. So they always put some girl in her underwear on it. Well, I know at, at, at Blue Moon, it was funny because you, you, you could tell the people in the art department didn't even know what the books were about because they would put like a, a modern-looking woman on a on – a, on a Victorian novel or something. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, my, Neptune and Surf takes place in 1955 in Coney Island, and Johnny's Girl takes place in Chicago in 1927, and, and they have this girl who's, you know, she looks like she stepped out of maybe 1974. So I don't know, but it's like, yeah, well, okay, Sex in America, there you go. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> don't scare me, Michael. <laughs> Oh, did did I did I vanish or something? Yeah, I, I didn't hear you for a moment, and I thought, oh no, I have to run this whole show myself. <laughs> uh -oh. No, if I vanish, uh, a mad painter will jump in. I'm back here. I'm just quiet. Oh, okay. Oh, Thank God. Woo! <laughs> There's been no calls. Anyone wants to call in? We got 20 minutes left, and uh, sometimes we get a lot of calls. Sometimes not. Um, let's talk about the anthologies. You you edited. Uh, I don't know, it looks like about half a dozen or so anthologies. Something like, like that. Stirring up a storm and Zowie. Zowie, it's Yowie. Yowie, uh-huh. What is that? that Western um, girls write hot stories of boys' love. Yeah, that's non-illustrated Yowie stories, and um, <laughs> that was like... Uh, Wait a minute, wait a minute, is this a, a, a genre, Yowie stories? Uh-huh, it's a Japanese genre, and it's... Oh, uh, okay, right. Yeah. Boys, boys falling in love with boys, and it's written by girls, and it's uh, a Japanese comic book uh, genre. 
And when e-books started to become popular in the early 2000s in America, uh, you know, Western girls started writing these boy love, love, boys loving boys stories, but they weren't illustrated, but they were still calling them yaoi. Yeah, and now it's like male, male erotica written by, you know, written by women. They dropped that label. But at the time when I was editing it, that was the label. That was what they were called. And, um, wow, did I get a... <laughs> I got a lot of grief over that one, you know, because the traditional Yaoi fans just, they were all over it. They they just hate, they hated that book just because it, you know, it wasn't illustrated. It wasn't a comic book and all that, so. Oh, yeah, those anima fans in the various genres are. They're hardcore, boy. They are hardcore, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I also, I edited with Maxim, I co-edited the Mammoth Book of Erotic Photography, which has just been a spectacular seller year after year for something like 11 years now. It's um, it's called um, the Mammoth Book of Illustrated Erotica in some places, and it's also called the Mammoth Book of Erotic Photography. And it came out all over the world, and it's sold out a million times, and, you know, it's done it's done really well, so that that's still out. That's the only um, non literature a book that i've uh that i've edited though oh right i'm back i got disconnected oh you did oh you didn't notice no <laughs> no nobody it, it, i was talking <laughs> oh well that's good yeah i'm not even going to tell you what i said <laughs> oh no was, was it about oi oi or, or no it was about the mammoth book of of erotic photography that i did with maxim oh yeah, yeah. that kind of that kind of went south didn't it no no it didn't i was saying how it sold very well and it still sells and it's all over the world i thought, so, there, yeah. I thought there was some uh there was a legal there. issue but i'm not going to talk about it on okay. the radio. yeah fine. yeah um yeah the the anthology the mammoth book of short erotic novels that i did with with maxim uh it, it's it's not really selling that well anymore but it, it's still in print yeah it's on, yeah. I think it's on its eleventh printing or something like that. I think those mammoth books—they just sell really well. I don't know what it is about it, but they sell really well. They're cheap. They're big and cheap. Yeah. I mean, they're printed on cheap paper, but they're, you know, I don't know where are they like seven bucks, eight bucks or something in, in the U.S. But uh, well, my mammoth book of legal thrillers <laughs> did not sell that well. Oh no. Oh. Well, I think it broke even. They were expecting it to, you know, you know, hit the John Grisham, Scott Turrell crowd, but it didn't. Oh, oh, oh. And I had some other issues with uh, rights. I don't know. It, it, it's the reason why I do not do any more of those books. Actually, I, I don't want to do any more anthologies. I don't even know why I ever did them in the first place. <laughs> I think just because I wanted a lot of books with my name on it. <laughs> well, you do have a lot of books with your name on it, Michael. Let's face yeah. it. Well, it's it's and most of them are out of print now, but uh, but that's all right. There are e-books. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm seeing the the cover for Sex in America. That's that's a, lo- a much better cover. Or or do you not like it? Um, you know, it's so it's better than the ones that came out in America, but it's still not the kind of cover that I would I would ideally like for that book. You know, because as you said, it's literary erotica. I mean, those are like some serious stories with graphic sex in it. You know, the the people have sex, which I think that you said in the, your upcoming interview in Something Dark, which I am the North American editor of. Um, this Something Dark magazine. You're you're our featured writer for the upcoming issue, and you they did an interview with you, and uh, where um, you know, t- for me when I was started writing um, erotica, to me it was like, well, I have relationships and I have sex in my relationships, and my life comprises of all different things plus sex, and so in my books the people also have sex but it's not the the reason that the book exists it's not just sex it's like there are stories being told and the people also have sex and um so i you know my dream for neptune and surf is that one day it'll have a cover that's you know appropriate to the stories that are are told in that book when you know when i published freak prayed by myself even though it i was kind of um disheartened that i had to publish it myself uh i i was at least able to to get 
uh, the cover that I wanted. I had it designed especially for that book, and I think the woman did an amazing job. She did a beautiful cover, and she actually read the book. You know, she read the book, and then she designed a cover based on what the book was about, which was like, wow, you know, that's a first for erotica, you know. So, so you, you, if you've never, like, been able to get the cover that you want with publishers or, or – uh, well, you know, KSAC a, a couple times. Actually, when Neptune and Surf first came out with Masquerade and Trade Paper, it was a beautiful cover. It was a flower, you know, a, a flower that hadn't yet opened. Um, it wasn't necessarily a bud, but it, it wasn't a flower yet. And, and But it was a beautiful cover, and I felt like women would be able to go into a bookstore and buy that and not be embarrassed about it, or you could read it on the subway train and not feel like you're reading a sex book. You know, so I, I appreciated the flower, you know, but it still had nothing to do with the book. But he, he did try to get, like, um, stock footage or stock photo of, of Coney Island, and it was just too expensive. And as you already said, Masquerade was getting ready to go out of business, you know, so they didn't have a budget. But um, uh, And he also, with my erotic romances, Richard gave me really beautiful covers, I have to say. His daughter designed the covers, and they were absolutely perfect for the, the stories that were being told, but everything else I have not uh, appreciated my covers. Let's put it that way. Well, Michael fell off again. Oh, did he? <laughs> yeah, he did. He well, should. did you like what I just said? <laughs> oh, oh, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm an artist myself, and, I, and oh, okay. I enjoy art, and I was looking at your book covers, and I, I believe I've read a couple of your books, believe it or oh, not. Oh, really? Oh, wow. And, uh, uh, I read the one on your what you have on the web page there, the one story you have there. I guess it's just part of a of a book, isn't it? The one Muriel the Magnificent or something yes, else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Muriel the Magnificent, it's interesting you brought that up, is because that's the one I had an issue with Kindle censoring it. They wouldn't allow me to publish it in its regular form, so I put it on my website so that if people do buy the Kindle edition of that collection and want to read the whole story, they can get it for free on my website. But yeah. Is that Michael back on the phone? Yeah, I, I got disconnected again, so now I'm, I've called him via phone. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so you're our call-in guest. <laughs> I, yeah, my, I actually should have called in on the on my iPad because you're on the iPad, aren't you, too? Right? So, iPad, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. iPad is wonderful. I mean, you, and that's the great thing about doing these radio shows via Skype. I mean, you you can do them anywhere. Yeah. I've I've been doing my shows from Tijuana to L.A., San Diego, Sedona, Portland. You know. Wow! Wow. Um, I'm going to do one on the beach one of these days. That's what I need to do. Oh, that'll be nice. Um, and since I got disconnected, I, have, I completely forgot what I was going to do. And we've, we've got 15 minutes left. Um, oh, I was going to say, you know, at, at, at Blue Moon, I, 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 I somehow talked him into letting me do my own covers. Uh, I, I either took photos of women I knew or... or got photos from photographer friends, and I was much more pleased with, with some of the covers than, than having these generic-looking covers that used to put out. Wow, you're so lucky. <laughs> oh, my God. Especially with Blue Moon. I mean, they were the most, you know, like production line kind of books going. Well, since they weren't even reading the books and, and, uh, and they wouldn't have to pay the rights for, for – well, actually, they did for uh, – friends of mine who, who did the photos, you know, but I think they paid like 200 bucks for the photo or something, they out that much. But they wouldn't pay me if I took the photos. They just, oh, a free photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, writers always <laughs> We won't go there. <laughs> uh, oh, I was going to ask you about Lust. Now, your, your collection Lust, uh, you know that Allison went out of business, right? Oh, no, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know they went out of business. I, th I think they're they're uh, they put all their list on on ebook. Yeah, they went they went out uh, at least print business like last year. I think they were going to put out this this uh, long awaited big eight hundred page novel by Samuel Delaney uh -huh. called uh, Through the Valley of Spiders, and and they went out of business or out of print business like a month before it was supposed to come out, and the uh, the uh, 
the editor there, who, who was over at Avalon, he was doing the, the gay fiction line for Carolyn Graff, uh, he started his own company called Magus Books. Um, Magus or Magus, I don't know how you pronounce it, but um, yeah, because that, that, that was the first thing. I was like, what if, if Marilyn's book is still in print over there? Well, they're probably just selling it out of some warehouse, you know, whatever whatever uh, print run is left, you know. Right. You, you, you don't hear from them, the uh, annual royalties or... or um, well, n now that you're mentioning it, it's probably has been over a year since I, since I heard from them. You know, that's the, that's the downside of being with so many different publishers is, you know, you lose track of who's keeping in touch with you. But that's very interesting that you brought that up because I know it's still selling on Amazon. So that'll be interesting. Yeah, you need to send them send them a, a communique. A little, a little letter. Where's my, yeah. where's my money? Where's my money? <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't lose track. You know, if my royalties are late, I'm I'm, I'm on it. it. It reminds me of uh, Isaac Asimov. He uh, since his books all sold really well, his deal with all his publishers is that he got paid monthly, um, on the first of the month, and come the first of the month. He would walk to every publisher in New York and pick up his check. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. You could do that back then, you know. Yeah, I guess. So is there or anything we haven't covered you wanted to talk about? We've got like 10 minutes. Well, I don't think so. I mean, I think that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. Well, how about, okay, paranormal experiences? Now, you had, you channeled Valentino. Uh, what, what other kind of paranormal, you, you said you'd never seen a UFO or an alien, right? Yeah, not that I'm aware of. That doesn't seem to be something that comes into my experience. But, um, yeah, I I was mentioning that, I, that I've been psychic my whole life. And the older I get, the more that the veil kind of completely disappears so that it's almost like, uh, there's there's not there's no wall between me and anything else almost. I mean I don't know how to really say that. I'm getting more psychic as I get older. But um, yeah, I've had all kinds of um, experiences with uh, dead people. You know that I knew. You know when they were alive. Um, communications with uh, dead people, and that's like whether I'm a, asleep or, or awake. You know that those kind of things have gone on since. I was in my twenties, uh, you know. But now you're saying you're, you get, you're getting more psychic as you get older. I mean, in, in what way are you predicting things? Or no, I'm not like that. But like, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of like, um, oh, just oh, I can't right off the bat like knowing uh, like who's who's coming up. Somebody will be coming up the sidewalk. I know that somebody's going to be coming up the sidewalk, and there they are. And or I know that somebody's going to a specific person is going to talk to me about a specific thing that day, and then they do. Um, uh, those it's just like nonstop now. It's like it's like constant. It's like there's no wall between. Um, you know, and it it's, it has to be with like people that I know. It's it's not with like strangers. You know. Um, there's like a familiarity kind of thing going on there, but um, but it's like constant. Like I, if I'm standing somewhere, I I, I know who's going to be coming out of the men's room, or you know, is it, it, that that kind of thing where it's now it's just nonstop. Hmm. Well, it, as it increases, maybe you'll start reading their minds and um, predicting the future, and maybe you'll get to see an alien. Maybe, yeah. Like, like an Andromedan. Uh, the show before us, they they were interviewing a, a guy who's contacted with Andromedans. Yeah, well, I Actually, thought, I really liked your interview and your story, of course, your nonfiction piece with something dark. I thought was re just amazing. I really loved it, and I and I loved the things you had to say about a a alien contact in, in in your interview. Oh, that's what I was going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a, a a magazine called Something Dark. It's a beautiful. It's just an online online magazine, right? Yes, correct. It's Something Dark. Dot EU. Yeah, Something Dark at, at, at EU. Dot dot EU. It's not dot com. Oh, dot it's EU. dot yeah. EU. Uh huh. The 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 third issue is coming out soon, and 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 Marilyn's 
the North American editor, and 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 I'm the featured writer in in this coming issue. And when when it's out, uh, we'll have Marilyn back on, and we'll be talking about that issue, and I'll read something from it maybe. And anyway, I have a a lengthy interview and a short story and uh, an essay. And the essay is about my paranormal experiences, which I've talked about before on on my show, which you can hear in the archives. You got but, three uh, minutes, by the way. Uh, three minute, three minute warning. <laughs> um, and, and actually, that's oh, that's what I want to bring up. I I need to uh, uh, start promoting my own books on this this radio program. Um, yeah, you should. Mm-hmm. We've got this other host, and he, he's more well-known than I am, obviously, but his name's Sean David Martin. And, you know, we don't make any money from doing these shows, but he he he's, he self-published a, a pretty big novel. It's like 500 pages called The Sands of Time. And he's selling, you know, about 500 copies a month, you know, these $35 books, um, which, which you know, is, is a decent amount of money. And, and he uses his radio program to promote it. And uh, um, I, I think I need to be doing that. Well, I'll certainly think? come back and we'll promote you when you're in something dark, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, promote, we'll promote that issue. Oh, do you know when it's coming out? Uh, no, I don't know exactly when, but, you know, obviously it's sometime this year. <laughs> sometime this year. <laughs> so now how, how would you describe something dark? It, it's, I mean, there's fashion. There's, it's very, very political. It's extremely it, political, and the politics borders on anarchy. Um, and it's much more European than American, and uh, they have amazing sensibilities. They're really smart. They're intelligent. It's um, beautiful art, beautiful photography, great writing. I don't know. It's a wonderful magazine. I love, love, love being a part of it. So what, what is European anarchy exactly? It's... Uh... Well, you know, we have one minute. I don't know how to just... Oh, okay, well, it. never mind. European anarchy out of, out of the U.K., you know, maybe some punk rock sensibility. Um, they seem to be a little kind of gothic uh, from what I've seen. Um, but amazing layout, though. I mean, this is, this is... Oh, we're at the end of the show. Well, well thank, thank you, Marilyn, you for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank and, you. And uh, we'll have you back.